So we take leather, fabric, specifically silk damask, buckle, and rosettes, and we make a belt to make Margaret of York jealous. On our last enthralling episode aboard Queen Victoria, we stumbled our way through, well, figuring things out. We measured the leather and fabric and made that first trepidatious cut. We sewed the silk damask into a tube and stuffed it into the silk damask sheath, and then cunningly finished the edges. And all without the use of proper tools. I mean, who needs tools? And now, the exciting conclusion. Right, so we're at the attaching stage, and first we're going to anchor the thread in, in situ, in the spot where we would like to start, before applying the belt buckle. Oh, it's hard to keep the camera still with the boat moving so much. <laughs> then we put the belt, or the strap in, we're on the strap in, not the buckle, sorry. We put the strap end on. We're going to be basically using these little beautiful filigree pieces as our anchor points and sort of eyelets. So we're going to come up first through the trefoil, and then we're going to wrap around that little ball right there. And then we're gonna go back down under that ball and then come back up through the next trefoil next to it. And so on and so forth all the way across. That is our plan. We're gonna see how that works. And the idea is to pierce the entire thickness. Oh, if you can move your hand. Yeah, the entire thickness of the belt with that stitch. Because unfortunately on the back, of the, oh, there is a back of the strap end. Sorry, you can come through the strap ends then, actually. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, I thought you were doing the buckle for some reason. Yep. Okay, then the plan is to go all the way through and do the inverse on the other side so that we catch both sides and create a super duper stable, super weaponizable belt strap end. That's the goal. Let's see how it goes. So, <laughs> some notes now that we've made a little bit of progress. The challenge is that you have to put the needle through at just the right angle in order to get through the, these tiny little trefoils in just the right spot. Um, and also, we just snap the needle <laughs> because it's a very torturous sort of process. Um, so you might lose a few needles in doing this. I think maybe poking a hole with a bigger needle, kind of like an awl, might might be a better idea. I'm not certain. Might lose nest needles that way. Okay, well, we shall rethread the needle and continue onward. Well, here we are. This is the attached strap end. Isn't that amazing? I'm probably gonna use lots of pathetic vocabulary like that throughout. Well, in any case, moving on to the buckle itself. What challenges will we find? Foreshadowing. So you've made sure that the belt is seated in all the way. I've done the first stitch. I've looped it around the little knob. And I'm trying to go back through into the trefoil. progress on the sewing. You can't barely even see it even with this close-up, but what I'm doing is I'm going into each of the trefoil around the outer edge and doing each trefoil soiled in, uh, soiled, sewn in twice to the leather belt to try and create as strong a bond as possible between the, the end and the belt itself. But I seem to have figured out a good way of doing it so far. And it's uh, not creating the prettiest line on the back, but I think that'll get better as I improve as I go around the edge. The hard part, of course, is making sure that the edge of the belt stays flush right in there. But there we go. Well, everyone, the process continues. Welcome to our London Heathrow Airport Hotel, the Crown Plaza. Uh, we are now to the part, the stage of marking the holes where we will put the beautiful little metal rosettes. So to do that, we're going to use me. <laughs> and I've got on a somewhat bulky um, 
turtleneck, which will not quite imitate all the layers I'll be wearing under this, but that's okay because, you know, different dresses will have different thicknesses. So we'll be putting in three sets of holes. So first we're going to mark the medium set. Yeah, medium set. Yep. Right. Well, I suppose we can just do it in the front. Yep, so we put it on, actually put it on me, place it roughly where it's going to be sitting when it's on my body, and mark three sets. We're going to mark basically a medium, uh, sort of medium tautness, a super taut, and a, we'll call it post-feast level of taut. And it's actually really easy on this. The, uh, the pattern gives us this center, central line right here. So we can just use that as the medium holes. And then for the really tight ones, it's looking like the outer lobe of the, <laughs> of the flower. Pomegranate. Pomegranate is good. And for the, the post dinner holes, the other outer lobe <clears throat> looks pretty good. So there was a happy accident in attaching the buckle to the belt. This is actually not perpendicular to the line of the belt. You can see there's this slight angle here instead of being probably it should be here if it were perpendicular. But that is actually okay because I have a bizarrely curvy rib cage and so I'm I'm not straight in my torso. It's very indented in my waist. So that actually means that the belt will actually have a slight outward angle when it's on my body. So that works out really great. Next thing we need to consider though is um, because this belt, this buckle has two tines, which will give it definitely extra strength and distribute the force of this corset-like belt across more of the leather instead of putting all the force on one spot. So that's great. And that was Armour and Casting's idea when we designed this particular buckle, that it should have two tines. Thank you, Armour and Castings. Now, the problem with two tines, of course, <laughs> is that you must then get your holes. These are the rosettes that we talked about. You must... Really, really pretty. Bling, bling, bling. So that means that you really need to line these up so that they are perpendicular to the line of the belt. And so we're going to have to figure out how to create that perpendicularity, perpendicularity without a T-square, because we don't have a T-square and we don't have any kind of drafting tools here. So we have a ruler, that's what we have. And I'm confident that ruler would not pass any engineering tests in the civil engineering world. So <laughs> that is what we must consider. And also, as I was just thinking about it, because of my weirdly shaped waist, we might want to take advantage of placing these holes in such a way that the upper set of holes is slightly looser than the lower set of, or slightly offset like this, so that we create even more of that angle to reflect my weirdly shaped torso and waist. Deep thoughts with the Condessa and her condottiero. We'll let you know what we decide onward. So we figured something out <laughs> um, and that was that we didn't, when we set all the lengths and the pattern, etc, etc, we didn't take into consideration the amount of extra length that the buckle itself lends to things, which means that for the pomegranate pattern to be centered in the front, the way we currently have it, it's going to have be significantly offset in the back, which means if I were really being so persnickety that I wanted this buckle to always buckle in the exact dead center of my back, then that would mean we have to redo the belt. <laughs> That's not happening. I'm not that persnickety. And I've also seen some Im images, for example, Mary of Burgundy and her book of hours, where it kind of looks like maybe the buckle is a little off center in the back anyway. Whatever, people's shapes changed, so probably that was a thing. Also, we get a different set of markings on where the rosettes should go by actually properly threading the belt through the buckle, which is what should have been done in the first place, but we didn't. So we're pointing out that it is very important to thread the belt through the buckle when you are marking your holes, because also you can use that buckle to get leverage to tighten it even more. <laughs> and if they can hear me, from my perspective, that, that changes it by almost half an inch from where I had originally tried to do the holes. So 
big change there. Okay, so the next important decision is uh, the size hole that we're gonna punch in the leather. We tried the all technique on the leather. I've never alled leather before, but it just split the leather, which is kind of what I thought was going to happen. Um, but so what we're going to do is poke a hole with an awl and then punch a hole through the leather, just the leather part with the hole punch. And so we had to decide which size. So we did this by taking the tines and testing to see how far each of the tines went in. And the one that went in the best amount was really this one. We could go with the slightly bigger hole, not in that direction though, <laughs> um, but we're concerned about the leather stretching on its own anyway. And what we really don't want are holes that are just too big. Uh, because that just, you, you want to preserve as much of the leather as possible for the structural integrity of the belt overall. And, um, you know, if the holes do stretch, then it's best to start off a little smaller and make them grow with time. Obviously, the rosettes will not change in size, uh, but the leather under the rosettes will change at least to match at maximum. It will stretch possibly to be the entire width of this hole, or the diameter of this hole. And the problem with that is that these are actually quite loose as you see around the bottom base of the tines and you know we don't want that because then you have a belt that will sort of rattle and we definitely don't want that so yes that's the logic that's how we came to the conclusion of which hole size to use on our punch Okay, so our attempt to uh, punch the hole through didn't quite work out as well as we'd like. So what I'm going to do now is take a very fine needle and attempt to whip stitch open the hole so I have better access to the leather underneath of it. We did do this originally because we thought it might be really difficult. Well, we'll see how difficult it is in a moment. <laughs> okay, so what we did was we uh, did a whip stitch, awesome. a whip stitch around the fabric to open it up. Uh, we attempted to punch a hole with the hole punch, but there was no good way with the tools that we had. So I essentially ripped the hole out that the hole punch started using the awl. And now I've got the hole all the way through. As you can see it mostly lines up. And what I'm going to do next, I think, right, is another whip stitch going through both yes both sides with it opened up as far as I can get it and yeah good times okay well continuing on with the belt we thought we would have to get one of those hammer drivers or hammer hole punches hammer dies drive punches I don't know <laughs> whatever the word is for that kind of hole punch to do the hole in this belt because the holes are too far into the center from the edge of the belt for a normal hole punch to work. But my clever brother-in-law had the idea that you could just fold in the edge of the belt and that will allow the hole punch to get to it. And then I got this really great high quality one from the local tractor supply store. So this is a serious hole punch. I could probably do serious bodily harm with this thing. Anyway, so that is how we're going to proceed. We're going to punch the hole using this. Um, I have actually lightly beeswaxed the spot where it will be punching through because I'm not confident that I'll be able to entirely miss the fabric and so therefore I don't want uh, it to fray. And we do have some extant garments. I believe the Gamora of uh, the Beato Osana um, that we're on the edges, they've actually fray checked the seam with beeswax. Now I don't have here, because this is a travel project, I don't have the right equipment here to heat up the beeswax, because really you need like one of those double boilers for that, and this is not my house, so I'm not gonna ruin my father's 
um, cooking equipment with beeswax. Um, so I'm going, I'm just attempting to use the heat of my fingers to soften it enough and kind of work it into the silk damask so that when we punch it, it will hopefully not fray before we have a chance to set the rosettes. Onward. Now, see, part of the problem is that we have the fabric and it's not glued to this. Um, so it can shift and what we don't want to have happen is for the fabric hole to ultimately line up differently than the leather hole and for the fabric to end up pulling and tightening and bunching the belt up. So this is a, this is a challenge with this. Would have been better with the, di the driver punch, drive punch, but there it is. Oh well, it's just a belt. I guess I can always make another one. lay it all out flatly to accomplish this. And there it is. Let's see what happened on the other side. Oh, that's interesting. It barely penetrated, so I might actually be able to use the awl to open this up, thereby preserving the fabric a little bit. Hmm. So I'm just working some beeswax into the edges here just to try to stabilize them a little bit. Especially here where it actually punched through the fabric. Would be better if I could just paint this on. But maybe a future project. So I've actually put the beeswax into there and I'm pushing it through with the awl. Well, it's actually a chopstick, but whatever. It's a, an improvised awl. It's what I have. Okay, moment of truth. The holes are in at least the first set, and maybe the only set that will get put in before this event. Let's see what happens. Okay, pomegranate up. Let's hope that the holes are the right length. Oh, <laughs> my mic, my mic wire, okay. Okay, two tines. It's a little fussy because the grommets aren't in place. But there it is. It works. The holes sit. So here is what the belt will look like if I wore it buckle in front in this jaunty, very phallic fashion. Uh, but I think with this one, I will probably be wearing it buckle in back with this particularly short belt, as it were. Fold it over like that. Yeah, it does look a little silly with that in front hanging like that. And it looks silly like that too. Yeah, I think we'll definitely be hanging it in the back. Yeah, it looks kind of okay that way, but yeah. Okay, there we go. So the next step in the process is putting the rosettes in. You can see this little, little thing here. And working on this, we want the dots to go up and down. So we carefully eyeball it over the hole we've already made. And I'm actually going to put the all in the spot and just drive that all through. And then do that for all three holes. Whoop. I got them through. 
going to push them down. Looks like the hole is properly lined up. Okay, so I want to try and make this as flush as possible. And then I'm going to use these, let's see here, round nose pliers to bend this over. First one in, you can use the awl to open the fabric hole, and there we go. Mm, doesn't that look lovely? Well, now that we've set the first rosette, um, we're going to actually experiment with this other one. So we're going to apply beeswax around the fabric edges as a way to seal the edges. This is a technique that's actually used in a couple of extant garments from the 15th century that uh, basically beeswax is used as fray check. And we've put some beeswax in a pot and then we put that pot in a bowl of boiled water, boiling temperature water, and it has melted the wax and it's keeping it liquid long enough for us, just long enough for us to brush it on. And we're actually, as you can see, there's actually a ring forming. And that should be, you really, that might be more than we actually need. Um, on the next set of holes, we're actually going to put apply the wax first to an area sort of the way you would swab an injection site with alcohol and then punch the hole to see if that um, actually creates more stability you can see there's a little bit of damage from where i wore this without any finishing at all at the, at the, the event at which i debuted the not quite complete belt so this back here is really a little bit frayed but the wax really seems to be doing its job doesn't it it really is catching the edges quite nicely. And then, of course, once we apply the rosette, that will not really, should not really be a problem. And maybe we can, we can probably scrape off any extra with the awl just by poking it through and sort of using the awl to work it into the edges. Okay, well, this experiment seems temporarily experimental. The concern, the only concern I'm going to have eventually is will the wax end up rubbing off on the garment on which the belt is worn? So I guess we'll find out. It shouldn't, hypothetically. It right, it will from the, maybe, but we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening. Uh, now I need to clean my own. Now if you melt wax and you don't put it in a double boiler, it will absolutely harden almost instantly. Wax, it, uh, <laughs> It hardens at a very, at a very, a relatively high temperature, actually. It also melts pretty easily, so you, there's a sort of narrow range there at which it's a spreadable temperature. similarly wide belt? What materials did you choose? Do you have any questions on this accessory or the process? Let me know in the comments below here on YouTube. Otherwise, until the next time, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of kitty zen.